Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to have uh, this opportunity and to uh, see friends. So um, this talk is about braid grooves. So that's the uh, first topic. But um, it's clear that most people in here know much more than I do about the braid groups. So I'm just going to assume everybody knows what they are. And we're going to just let finish with that topic. Um, now, the next one <laughs> uh, is going to be on three elementary constructions. Three elementary constructions. So um, let's draw a picture of a braid, a non-trivial braid. So here's a, um, <coughs> a good example. That's a, a two-stranded pure braid, which is, of course, non-trivial. Now, what I'd like to do is think of this as braiding tubes. So just uh, thicken up the strings. And now the first elementary construction is to insert an I-stranded trivial braid in the first tube. So you can imagine putting in an I-stranded trivial braid in that way. And then uh, you could imagine putting in an N plus one minus I stranded trivial braid here. So um, let me give you uh, an example or two examples of these. So uh, we could let um, N plus one be equal to three. And so you can imagine Um, this three-stranded braid, which is gotten by putting two strands in the first cable, in the first tube, and one in the second. Or you could imagine putting one in the first and two in the second. In particular, this braid, this braid has a total of, let's see, n plus one strands. So I can call, the, let me call this braid x sub i. That's its name. So x sub i is an element in the n plus first pure braid group. If I had talked about the braid groups in section one, I would have said that this is the notation for the pure braid group on n plus one strands. So now notice that um, what we have cooked up is a set of n braids in the n plus first pure braid group by letting i vary from 1 to n. And um, now uh, you can imagine extending this over the free group on n letters. Let me call that theta sub n. And uh, sometimes during the talk, I'm going to uh, denote that free group on n letters as f sub n. So um, well, you could ask, uh, what subgroup is this? Is, is this, in fact, a, uh, 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 the, uh, a free subgroup of the pure braid group? So the pure braid group has lots of free subgroups. Um, this one. Uh, is kind of peculiar in the sense that it gets smeared all over the uh, braid group. And in fact, uh, um, many of the free groups in the braid groups are in the kernel of the projection maps from the nth pure braid group to the n minus first. These are not. These are never in the kernel of those projection maps. So it's kind of a symmetrized free group. And um, well, the first theorem I want to talk about, and this is uh, joint work with um, uh, G. Wu and related work with G. John Barrick 
and Yan Lai Wang. So the first theorem is that um, theta n is 1 to 1. Now, the first question you should ask is, why is this even an interesting theorem? Another question is, how do you prove that a map out of a free group is 1 to 1? Well, um, um, there are various methods. One goes back to Felix Klein using the ping pong lemma. I, I don't know how to apply that here, but what we're going to do is try to give a different proof. And uh, let me uh, talk about that proof a little bit because it's going to provide a framework for the rest of the lecture. So um, what, one way you might try to show, and again, and again please bear with me, this, uh, this sort of uh, uh, peculiar homomorphism actually fits into several different contexts. But I would like to focus on this one to start. Uh, well, one thing you might do is um, start off with a discrete group and consider the Lie algebra obtained from the descending central series of G. So the descending central series is uh, a filtration of groups. The nth group is the subgroup generated by commutators of weight at least n. And the filtration quotients form a Lie algebra where the uh, Lie bracket is induced by the commutator map on the level of groups. Now, um, well, uh, you might ask, what happens with this map theta? Well, we could look at E star uh, the uh, Lie algebra obtained from the descending central series of the free group. Well, this was uh, analyzed classically in 1933 by Philip Hall. Um, and Philip Hall's theorem is that this is isomorphic to the free Lie algebra on n generators. Now, I'm uh, being obscure here. That is, these generators are the actual projections of those xi's that we talked about uh, earlier. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, descending central, the Lie algebra obtained from the descending central series is a functor. So you get an induced map to the Lie algebra obtained for the uh, descending central series of the uh, pure braid group on n plus 1 letters. Now you can ask, what is that? Well, there are several people in this room who ask that. In particular, um, Toshitaki Kono um, used this in his work on Vasiliev invariance of pure braids. Mike Falk and Dick Randall studied uh, these kinds of Lie algebras in a, in a, in a wider framework. Well, um, let me just recall what the answer is here. The answer is the free Lie algebra on some symbols. Maybe I better call them Bij where um, i is less than j, and that's less than or equal to n plus 1, and i is bigger than or equal to 1, modulo what Toshitaki called the infinitesimal braid relations. Now, um, in case you're not all uh, friends with the infinitesimal braid relations, uh, they are that Bij bracketed with Bst is 0 if the set Ij intersect the set St is empty, and that Bij um, uh, Bik plus um, Bkj is 0. 
So I'm being a, a little bit vague here, but this is uh, one of them. And uh, one of the reasons I'm being a little bit vague is that I'm addicted to the graded analog. And I don't want to <laughs> put that in, as it will confuse matters. Well, so let's see. Um, you've got a picture of what's going on with these braids. So it's very easy to uh, at least um, start this computation. <laughs> and uh, what you end up proving is that this map is one to one. So that's a theorem. Now again, um, there may be a better way to do this. I don't know a better way other than computing the daylights out of it. Uh, uh, what's interesting is there's a factor of two that appears throughout this. And I'm going to try to place that factor of two in a context with something else uh, shortly. OK, well, knowing, um, and again, the structure of this thing is really crucial in actually analyzing this map. Now, why would you care that this map is one to one on the level of Lie algebras? Well, the free group on n letters is residually nilpotent. And so if you have a morphism of Lie algebras out of this thing, which embeds, then the original map wasn't embedding. So that uh, proves this theorem. So uh, Vasiliev invariants were used to prove this. And now, as a side issue, I want to uh, 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 mention a similar property about pure braid groups. So I, I now want to make an aside. So suppose somebody asked you whether a uh, homomorphism from the pure braid group to a group is an embedding. So you might try to do something similar or try to find some analog of the ping pong lemma. Well, it turns out there's a similar rather simple criterion for testing whether a map out of the pure braid group itself is an embedding. And uh, what you do is you look at the induced map on Lie algebras again. Now, um, in the results of Kono, Falk, and Randall, you'll see that this thing actually contains some free Lie algebras. And I want to look at something that I'll call the top free Lie algebra. It's the free Lie algebra generated by bi n plus 1. So it's when the last index is always n plus 1. So that's, in some sense, the Lie algebra from this top free group in the pure braid group. And now let's assume, let's assume one, that this map is one to one. So let's assume that map is one to one. Now it's not always easy to test that, but let's make that assumption. And now um, let's consider, let's consider the uh, center of the pure braid group. Notice that the product of all the AIJs in a certain order lies in the center. And so the projection of that product lies in the center of this Lie algebra. So the next assumption is um, assume that E0 star of f on the sum of the bij's has infinite order. In other words, it of course generates an infinite cyclic subgroup of this Lie algebra. And you can just ask whether this central element has an inf infinite order in the image. Well, um, these two, 1 plus 2, implies that f is 1 to 1. So um, this is suggesting that you know, there may be some, something, uh, well, <laughs> there's something more going on. Okay, so these Lie algebras are frequently very useful for testing whether a homomorphism out of 
a discrete group like a pure Bray group or a free group is one to one. Okay, now I promised um, three elementary constructions. So um, I now have to give you um, two more. Well, uh, let's start off with the n, uh, n plus first pure braid group again. And you all know that that's the fundamental group of the ordered configuration space of n plus one points in the complex numbers. And the configuration spaces admit projection maps. So you can imagine looking at the induced map on the fundamental group. And so there are projection maps. Let me just call them 1 up to n plus 1. They're n plus 1 projection maps. Well, um, um, there's a subject that developed uh, in the late 40s and early 50s called simplicial topology. And people changed. We used different indexing. So I'm going to call this d0 through dn. So these are just the projection maps, namely, um, d sub i means forget the ith coordinate. That's all it's doing, forget the ith coordinate. There's an induced homomorphism here. So you all know that construction. That's the second elementary construction. So Dev was using this yesterday. Now, there's also a map back. How can you imagine mapping back? Well, suppose you start off with a pure braid. Well, what were we doing in this construction? What we were doing was taking this pure braid and doubling that strand. But there's more than one way to double a strand here. You could pick this choice, which I'm going to call S0, or you could pick um, that choice, which I'm going to call S1. So those are the two other elementary constructions. Now you can ask, um, what if you iterate these constructions, these DIs and SJs? Well, let's see. Suppose we looked at S0 and doubled the first strand, and then either deleted the first or the second. So we would get a map back. What happens when you delete the first or the second? Well, you get the identity. That's called a simplicial identity. And in fact, there's something called a simplicial group. And this is, in some sense, the basic example of a simplicial group. So I'm going to call this um, AP star. So AP star is a, um, is a um, simplicial group. And I'm going to say what that means. I'm going to say what a simplicial group means. And you'll see that this is, uh, the, in some sense, a rather basic example. So, uh, let me just recall that a simplicial group is a family of groups, gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, gamma n. And there are two maps out of the first, three out of the second, et cetera. And then, um, well, in fact, there are um, n plus 1 maps out of the nth. And there are n plus 1 maps out of the nth to the n plus first. And they s you can ask, uh, what properties do they have? Well, they have exactly the properties that you see by inspection from the braid group. So the braid group just tells you what the simplicial identities are. I'm not going to write them down. Try it yourself. <laughs> You'll learn something about simplicial groups. Um, well, how do you get something from the braid group in this way? Well, 
Um, gamma 1, by definition, is going to be the second braid group. Gamma 2 is the third pure braid group. And gamma n is the n plus first pure braid group. And gamma 0, in this case, will be the pure braid group on one strand, which isn't very big. <laughs> yes? The maps are the projections, and the other maps going up are the doubling maps. So that's what um, roughly what Dev was looking at yesterday, but he had one extra map going that way, and that makes a huge difference. But what I'm going to do in this lecture is stick to this critter right here, okay? So it's close to what Dev was looking at, uh, but not precisely. Now, what I'd like to do is recall some examples of simplicial groups that Milner cooked up in the 1950s. So I want to recall Milner's free simplicial group. So these are um, more examples of simplicial groups. And um, the idea is that you start off with a simplicial set. Well, that's just a set with these face and degeneracies that satisfy the simplicial identities, which you now all know by looking at the braid groups. And now um, you fix a point P in degree 0. You fix a point P in degree 0. And now let me give you Milner's free group construction. So this is now a simplicial group. It's a collection of groups with face and degeneracy satisfying the simplicial identities. And here's what it is. I have to tell you what it is in degree n. Well, this is the free group on the n simplices of this thing. Just form the free group on that. Modulo the single relation that s naught to the n of this fixed point is 1. So that, that is. Um, like the role of a base point. You need s something like a base point in this business. OK, well, um, now we can identify a p star. It turns out that uh, the next theorem is um, 1. Well, a p star was this natural simplicial group obtained from the pure braid groups. I can't say what AP star is any better than what nature tells you. <laughs> it's just this thing built out of the braid groups. However, there's a way to form the loop space of a simplicial group. And the theorem is that the loop space of AP star is isomorphic as a simplicial group to Milner's free group on the one simplex. So the braid groups are, in some sense, just building up the one simplex in some world. Now, we um, looked at um, this map, uh, theta n, induced by this picture. So recall, we had a map theta n from fn into pn plus 1. So that was this uh, kind of naive picture. And we went to, through some trouble using uh, the Lie algebra of Kono, Falk, and Randall to see that this map was an embedding. And a corollary of that is that um, theta n induces a monomorphism of simplicial groups from Milner's free group construction on the circle to AP star. In other words, um, this picture, this picture of braids is nothing more, it's precisely making a simplicial subgroup, which is Milner's free group construction for the simplicial circle. Now, why would you care about something like that? Well, um, Milner also proved the theorem that if you think of the geometric realization of his free group construction in case x naught 
is exactly one point, then this is homotopy equivalent to the loop space of the suspension of the realization of x. In other words, this thing corresponds to the loop space of the two-sphere. And what this is now telling you, a corollary, is that um, the um, nth homotopy group of the loop space of the two-sphere is isomorphic to a natural subquotient of Pn plus 1. I'm going to talk about that subquotient a little bit now. So I should caution you. <laughs> the homotopy groups of the loop space of the two-sphere or the two-sphere are not known. Quite a bit is known about them, but those groups are not known and they're rather complicated combinatorially. So, um, it's not just the single that time you assemble it. That right. You so, in fact, um, if you look at this in degree n, if you look at this in degree n, this is pn plus 1. This is a free group on n letters. And the theorem is that this is theta n. So in fact, it turns out that when you look at the simplicial group gotten from the pure braid groups, the smallest simplicial subgroup containing the two-stranded twist, or, uh, the ge generator for P2, is uh, the loop space of the two-sphere. <laughs> in this context. OK, now, um, um, now uh, the uh, next thing that I want to talk about in this context is the notion of a of uh, Brunian braids. So um, I want to uh, describe a group which I'm going to call Brune Q inside of the Q th pure braid group. And the definition of the Q-stranded Brunian braid group is the uh, subgroup of pure braids, which are trivial after deleting any strand. So um, you can imagine having a pure braid, and if you and you would like that braid to be trivial. So what's an example of that? What's an example of a Brunian braid? Um, Let's see, did I get that right? That looks Brunian. Let's check. What happens when you delete the third strand? Well, that's trivial. You get the trivial braid. <laughs> if you delete the second strand, notice that you can take that lip and pull it. Um, uh, oh, no, I goofed up. Um, if you delete the second strand, then you can pull that around. And then if you delete the third, oh, I goofed it up completely. I goofed it up. Let, let me get it straight later. OK, so I'm sorry about that. Uh, the way I think about it is uh, if you take those two braids that we constructed earlier, uh, um, take those two braids. And um, 
that one and compute the commutator. It turns out the commutator, I was trying to draw a picture of the commutator. Um, that turns out to be Brunian. Try it. <laughs> All right, now I want to look at the almost Brunian braids. I want to look at um, the almost Brunian Q plus one stranded braids. This is the subgroup of PQ plus one with the property that um, uh, it's the subgroup of braids which become trivial after deleting any of the second, third, up to Q plus first strands, but not the first, not necessarily the first. Okay, So you can imagine having a braid on 10 strands, and if you delete any of the last nine, the braid becomes trivial. That's just, that's the requirement. All right, now um, I'd like to make some observations about the Brunian braid group. So um, if you think of the um, pure braid group on n plus 1 strands, that contains the Brunian n plus 1 stranded braid group by definition. And now you could consider the projection maps, which I'm going to call D0 or D0. That's just the map that throws away the first strand. Now, notice that if you think of the almost Brunian n plus 2 stranded braids, that they, of course, after deleting the first strand, give you a Brunian n plus 1 stranded braid. And it's clear that, um, well, this map is a surjection, and this one is a surjection. I mean, uh, so you could all demonstrate that in kindergarten, right? I mean, if you have a, a Brunian braid, <laughs> and just put on a first strand. So this gives you a subgroup of the n plus 2 stranded Brunian braids. So this map is a uh, surjection. Now what I'd like to do is take this, um, the Brunian braid group, and I would like to intersect it with Fn plus 1. What is Fn plus 1? Well, by using these Vasiliev invariants, Fn plus 1 was a free group of Pn plus 2. So I would just like to consider the intersection of that free group that we described earlier with the almost Brunian braids. And um, notice that it restricts to give a map. And um, now I can pose the first homework problem. And my first homework problem is describe this, this map on the first homology group. So I just want to indicate that when you try to play with it, it has a lot of fl the flavor of the partition function and the uh, generating function associated to the classical partition function. Now, why am I interested in this? Well, uh, let's see. We've just seen that these two maps are onto. And now you could ask what this map is. And it is not onto. Uh, but what this uh, theorem tells you is that the co-kernel is um, um, pi n plus 1 of the 2 sphere. So what's happening is that this um, naive free group intersected with the almost Brunian braids are giving you all the relations in the homotopy groups of the uh, 2 sphere. Um, so again, I, I have to caution you, this is not useful for computations. It's not useful for computations. OK, um, so in the, 
Hopf map comes from the Borromean ring? Um, if I got this right, actually I practiced this and I goofed up, the commutator of x1 with x2 gives the Hopf map. This is supposed to be a picture of the Hopf map if I get it right. I'm not so good at drawing pictures at the blackboard, so if anybody wants to see it, let's do that later. Okay? So I'd like to continue with some other connections of the stuff. Um, so, and again, I've lied to you. This is plus or minus the Hopf map. So it comes up in a very uh, naive way. Um, well, um, here's another thing you might ask. Um, do you get any more interesting the braid groups in this sort of a simple way? Well, let's make some axioms to try to do that. So we're going to define a collection of, of simplicial groups, B. This will be a collection of simplicial groups which satisfy the following property, that This simplicial group that you get naively from the configuration spaces required to be in it, and, um, uh, and that this is closed with respect to simplicial subgroups uh, quotients and free products. So it's again the kind of thing that you that you know would occur in nature, and you could ask, which simplicial groups do you get out of this by just starting with Artin's braid groups, and then, well, closing that up with respect to taking simplicial subgroups, simplicial quotient groups, and free products of what you have, and the theorem is, the theorem is that um, if X, oh, I've used X. If Y is a connected CW complex, then there exists a gamma in B such that um, the realization of gamma is homotopy equivalent to um, the uh, loop space of Y. So in other words, um, it's not just that you're getting um, uh, the loop space of the two-sphere. You're getting all connected CW complexes via these uh, naive constructions. Um, now, again, I, I'm not sure if this has any real use, but uh, it, uh, it seemed rather curious to me that you got um, essentially all C connected CW complexes from naive constructions involving the braid groups. And again, the basis of this theorem, the basis, the guts of this theorem is uh, the information that you get out on the level of Lie algebras that I mentioned earlier. Well, um, now that we're going back to those Lie algebras, you could ask, well, is there something else going on with them? Well, let's look at more Lie algebras. So this is um, section five, more Lie algebras. Well, instead of using the descending central series of a discrete group, another classical construction is the mod p descending central series. So we could look at uh, more Lie algebras obtained from the mod p descending central series. So if we start off with a group, I will write e, um, e0 star p for the Lie algebra obtained from the mod p descending central series. So the mod p descending central series arises by filtering a group by a p to the s powers of commutators. And if the length of the commutator 
times p to the s is bigger than or equal to some integer, that's in the filtration. That's the classical definition. Um, well, now we could look at the same map, the same map from the free group on n letters to pn plus 1. So again, that was that naive picture that we talked about at the beginning. And now, uh, instead of looking at the Lie algebra obtained from the uh, descending central series, we'll look at this uh, thing mod p. And um, well, um, what do you get out of that? What do you get out of that? Well, the uh, proof that I mentioned earlier, some Lie map of Lie algebras was an embedding, um, gives the following theorem. Um, the map induced by theta n on the level of uh, Lie algebras obtained from the mod p descending central series is an embedding. So um, there are some modifications here which are modifications of what uh, Kono, Falk, and Randall did. You've got to do some modifications, uh, but it turns out that it uh, works, uh, their methods work very directly. Now, why would you care that these maps are an embedding? Well, it turns out that um, right here, these gadgets, when we looked at the um, That Lie algebra, people have looked at that in homotopy theory for uh, over 40 years. There's a spectral sequence that um, abuts to the p torsion in the homotopy groups called the unstable atom spectral sequence. And this is the um, E0 term of the classical. unstable atom spectral sequence. So by looking at Vasilyev invariants, you're actually computing in the unstable atom spectral sequence. Not the differentials, but you're looking at the E0 term. Now another homework problem is whether that spectral sequence informs on Vasilyev invariance or vice versa. I just have no idea at the moment. Uh, but it seems like an interesting homework problem. OK, now, um, quotients. Right, I wanted to mention something about quotients. Um, because these are where this stuff first originated. So instead of considering uh, free groups, you might consider a natural quotient of the free groups. So um, natural quotients. Well, um, suppose you consider the free group on n letters. One natural quotient is uh, the following. You could um, think of the commutator x i sub t, where sum x i j is x i s for i less than s. And then you could quotient out by the smallest normal subgroup containing all of those. So this is still an abele a, a non abelian group. It's now, no potent, it's a no potent non abelian group. Now, it turns out that this was also defined by Milner, but not in this way. This is something called the reduced free group. 
And Milner uh, used this to study um, a given variance of homotopy lengths. And uh, Hobbiter and Lynn and uh, Chao Song Lin used this to study homotopy string links. Now, if you just um, look at this, it turns out all of this descends to um, some simplicial world, which um, I should say, the thing I'm going to talk about, mention now, was a calculation that I did uh, 13 years ago and never really understood how it uh, fit with uh, homotopy string links until just a few years ago. It turns out that if you replace, if you replace Fn by, uh, let's call this Kn, by Kn, then you have maps out of Kn to something called, which I will call the reduced pure braid group. So how would you obtain a reduced pure braid group? Well, the pure braid group is an iterated semi-direct product of free groups. And you can imagine cooking up a family of groups which replaces the free groups and which accept maps from the pure braid group. So they're natural quotients. And it's not hard using Artin's representation of the braid group and the automorphism group of the free group to show that you get many families of this in a canonical way. This is one case. And so you get a uh, simplicial group. There's a, uh, uh, there exists a simplicial group, or there is a simplicial group, K of S1, which in degree N is Kn. So it's exactly what's happening with Milner's free group construction. But instead of using that, replace the free group by the reduced free group. And um, the reason I wanted to mention this in this audience is that you guys already know the homotopy groups of this. In particular, um, the uh, nth homotopy group of this. Now, this is not an accident. I just want to mention it. Uh, the nth homotopy group is. Um, H n minus 1 of the nth pure braid group, but not as a module over the symmetric group. You've got a tensor with the sign representation. So it's really the top non-vanishing homology group of configurations in R3 rather than in R2. So um, uh, you can see quite a bit of uh, what Habegger and Lynn did, and it's embedded in this in a very uh, rather natural way. OK, and the thing that I want to, uh, <coughs> oh, uh, there are two things that I want to uh, quit with. One is the connection to the mapping class groups. So um, when you start looking around, these naive maps that we talked about at the beginning, these maps theta gotten by just inserting strands, occur, it, it turns out they occur all over the place. So let me give you uh, 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 one uh, kind of uh, cute example. So there are several folks here who like to compute the cohomology of free groups or split extensions of free groups. Um, that's a very hard problem, I think. Uh, so let me give you uh, an example. Let's look at this free group on two letters and this map theta of 3 to the pure braid group on uh, three strands. So that was this extremely naive map gotten by doubling two possible strands. And now recall that uh, P3 is a subgroup of uh, B3 and that B3 classically maps to SL2 over the integers. 
And this, in fact, is a natural map obtained in general from a Bray group to the mapping class group of some surface. I'll say a bit more about that. And now um, let's look at the reduction to PSL2Z and then consider the kernel of a mod 2 reduction map. So this is, group is called the uh, uh, principal congruent subgroup of level 2. And it's not hard to see that you get a map here. And you can ask, what is this? What is that? Well, a little calculation tells you that this is an isomorphism. And so um, this will, it's not very hard. But then you could ask about the cohomology of this group. That's just a free group on two letters. And um, you now have a two-dimensional representation. And so um, you can think of uh, the symmetric powers in that. And uh, this was computed by Shimura. Um, this is the uh, ring of modular forms associated to the principal congruent subgroup of level 2. And uh, you can use this, in fact, to measure eta. So now uh, another homework problem is to think of the free group on um, 2G plus 1 letters. Think of that map theta. And now this maps to the mapping class group for um, genus G surfaces. Oh, well, maybe I better put it in the braid group first of all. There's a uh, classical map of the braid group to the uh, mapping class group. This map is rarely surjective. It's only surjective for genus uh, 0 and, uh, 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 oh, no, uh, genus uh, 1 and 2. Sorry about that. It's surjective for genus 1 and 2. And then look at the classical. Uh, symplectic representation. And so it becomes very interesting to try to work out the cohomology of the free group with coefficients in the symmetric powers of um, this um, 2G dimensional representation. So that's um, the last homework problem. Now, I want to quit with some remarks about P1. So there have been a lot of talks about our uh, complex numbers, or con configurations in the cl complex numbers, and also P1. So let me quit with the last example. And that is, um, um, let's consider the configuration space of uh, Q points in P1. Um, that's got a fundamental group. And so. You could uh, play the same game here. These are given by the natural projection maps. So again, when I say projection, think of the configuration space. Delete a point. There's an induced map and a map on the fundamental groups. Well, how many such maps are there? Well, again, there's D0. There, there, there are exactly Q of them. Well, this doesn't quite give you a simplicial group. And uh, the reason it doesn't is basically the Lefschetz fixed point theorem. Lefschetz fixed point theorem tells you you can't have degeneracies. But people have studied things like this. They're called delta groups. So instead of, think of a simplicial group without the degeneracies, without the doubling maps. So you could still define uh, the uh, homotopy of, of this thing. And uh, the th theorem, if I call this group gamma q minus 1, and then this is gamma q minus 2, this gives you a delta group. And you could ask what pi i of that is. Well, the associated sets are not always groups. But the theorem is that if um, i is bigger than or equal to 4, this is an abelian group, and it's um, pi i of the two-sphere. So again, that's not going to be useful for computing. But uh, uh, what I'd uh, like to know is uh, how to solve this homework problem that I mentioned earlier, namely, how do you describe a map on the first homology group? 
Okay, I think I'll quit there. Thank you very much. Here's what's happening. There's something like that, but not quite. Um, uh, uh, I'm not sure I can give you a sensible answer uh, just off uh, the top of my head. There's, there's a natural combinatorial construction here. And I, maybe I'll just say the words. You know what an exterior algebra is. Drop the abelian axiom. Think of the non-commutative version of the exterior algebra. Um, the non-commutative version of an exterior algebra uh, turns out to contain these groups via some analog of the Magnus expansion. And um, uh, the reason this is coming up is basically by uh, looking at some uh, partially ordered sets obtained from the Magnus expansion. So I, maybe the thing to do, instead of me ranting and raving, why don't we talk about that after?